Welcome to the Fear and Courage podcast, where we tell the stories of military veterans, law enforcement officers, and first responders. These careers are intense and in many ways foreign to the majority of people. You'll hear stories of unique experiences, intense physical and emotional stress, and lives changed as a result of a career of service. By telling the impactful stories of education, training, operations, traumas, victories, career paths, and family experiences that come from service, we hope to better understand the full impact of one person's choice to serve. I hope for the personal impact on those who serve to be a factor in the national conversation about military deployment thresholds and national and state law enforcement first responder policy and regulation. Today on the show we have Major General Retired David Burford. Dave graduated from Georgia Tech with a degree in chemical engineering and started with Southern Company in research and environmental affairs. In his current role, he's responsible for oversight of the governance, oversight, support, performance management model to achieve fleet excellence. He's previously been acting director of fleet security and was Southern Nuclear Company's first manager for the emerging field of cybersecurity. Dave is a past advisor to the Electric Power Research Institute, a speaker at the Washington Coal Club, and a graduate of both Harvard University and George Washington University's senior executive program. He is also the past chairman of the Nuclear Sector Coordinating Council in Washington, D.C., and holds a current top-secret security clearance. On the morning of 9-11, Dave was mobilized to serve as Deputy Commanding General of Army Special Forces as second in command of the Army's Green Beret Force in several combat theaters, serving almost three years on active duty. Dave retired as a Major General after 38 years in uniform as a Deputy Commander, U.S. Special Operations Command, while concurrently serving as Special Assistant to the Chief of National Guard Bureau in the Pentagon. He currently serves on the Board of Directors of the FBI's Joint Terrorism Task Force in Birmingham, as Vice President of Birmingham's Veterans Day Foundation, and as a past chairman of the board for a 501c3 nonprofit, Three Hots and a Cot, that supports the needs of homeless veterans, one of the nation's top 25 veteran support groups as recognized by President George W. Bush and the Bush Presidential Library in 2014. Speaking of that, on each episode of the Fear and Courage podcast, we highlight one nonprofit organization that serves the veteran, law enforcement, or first responder communities. Three Hots and a Cot is a, vet- is a nonprofit based in Birmingham, Alabama, that supports homeless veterans with temporary housing, meals, counseling, medical and dental services, and job placement services. The organization runs two houses in the Birmingham area, and since opening, 926 veterans and family members serviced by Three Hots and a Cot have moved into independent housing, reconciled with families, or moved on to other VA programs. The mission of Three Hots and a Cot is to assist homeless military veterans in their transition from a life on the streets into a self-sustained lifestyle. You can find them at cotsforvets.org and on Facebook at Three Hots and a Cot. This is the third episode of the Fear and Courage podcast. Welcome to the show. Entered Special Forces as a, or went to Special Forces selection as a first lieutenant, correct? As a captain. As a captain, okay. And you commissioned mm-hmm. out of Georgia Tech's ROTC program? Tech Army ROTC, and I went down the combat arms detail route is because my degree was in chemical engineering. They just kind of unilaterally threw me in the chemical corps. Uh, during that exposure, I would ask general officers to come speak at some of the graduations of the local NBC school for the 1st Infantry Division. And one of those generals invited me to be his aide. While I was his aide, I met some Special Forces guys, was quite impressed, and decided that was a route I was going to take. And so the typical next steps from there, as a first lieutenant or captain, you put that packet in to, to try and go to Special Forces selection, right? It was different, a little bit different then. Yeah, you put the packet in, but during that time, your conventional leadership at each level had to agree and concur that you, they'd let you go do that. And mine never got off first base. Every battalion and brigade commander, division commander above me said, heck no, you're not going to that. You know, we got your career mapped out for you. And I kind of ran down that road. I think three times I submitted to go to Special Forces back in the 70s, and they said, no, you're not going to do that. And I said, well, yes, I am. So I... <laughs> I resigned my regular Army commission and became a civilian, purposely coming back to Alabama because I knew it had National Guard Special Forces units. And then, uh, so basically, once you received, uh, or once you were, you know, had the National Guard commission and, and were able to go to selection from there, uh, got selected and went through the qualification course and Correct. pursued your Special Forces career as an officer in the National Guard from that point on. <laughs> That was it. That was the path I took. 
at the time I, I, when I left, I didn't have a job. I interviewed in positions in several cities, came back to Alabama because it was home. And of course, it had the Special Forces unit here. It wasn't an immediate transition into the National Guard. I had to be interviewed and get on a wait list for Special Forces. Um, they didn't accept everybody even into the unit, even if you weren't qualified. You had to have the potential to get qualified was really the, the hurdle you had to pass. So a, a guardsman or any reservist leads two lives, one Monday through Friday in his office doing whatever he does, then on weekends or drill weekends, you're in the military. So in, in the, not too soon after I got back to Birmingham, uh, I joined the Alabama National Guard and sat through this interview and selection local process to get to special forces school, but I still had that day job. And that day job at Southern Company, because my degree was in chemical engineering, I did environmental work on fossil-fired power plants. Okay. And so going, you know, back and forth between your day job and then on the weekends or one weekend a month and for, uh, you know, two weeks a year or for whatever the annual training requirement is, um, I know that that varies depending on unit priorities, especially when you get into special operations. But um, as, a, as a general officer on 9-11, uh, I, what I'd like to hear is, is kind of how that, how that day went for you and, and um, how, that, how that day immediately changed the, the direction of your career. Um, uh, it was a remarkable day. And just to, to give you the, the background of how I got there, fast forward several years in a paragraph, <laughs> I served in all, all the positions that the Alabama National Guard had in Special Forces, concluding my assignment as the 20th Special Forces Group Commander. Um, the only other job after that was to become a, a a senior leader of the Alabama National Guard or, because it was Special Forces, some active elements that had reserve component pieces or, or reserve component parts. Some of the deputy commander positions were actually reservists. And in fact, the U.S. Army Special Forces Command deputy commander of a one-star was a reservist, a National Guard position. Well, I interviewed for that job and was selected to be the deputy commander in February of 2001. So while I awaited the general officer confirmation process, February, March, April, May, through the summer of 2001, I was the deputy commander of Special Forces as an Alabama Guardsman serving at Fort Bragg on a, on a drill status. But, of course, drills ended up being a week or two. You alluded to the fact that it's two, week, two weeks a year and every weekend a month. As you gain rank and you get more involved, it becomes a little bit more intense than that. Certainly the Fort Bragg deputy commander job was. So on the morning of 9-11, I was employed by the Southern Company. I was in a watermelon field in Tampa buying the land from a farmer to put a, a competitive power plant on that piece of land when my cell phone rang. It was my oldest daughter uh, who was almost hysterical because I was supposed to be in the Pentagon that day uh, telling me that something had happened to turn on my car radio and my cell phone rang a second time. It was my two-star boss at Fort Bragg said, get your stuff and get up here. And I went from there to being on active duty for almost three years uh, in the global war on terror as the deputy commander of special forces. And certain periods of time, I was the acting commander uh, between uh, commanding generals from active duty who weren't available to command. And uh, I imagine that the civilians in the watermelon field in Alabama, you said, uh, my, in Tampa, my, in Tampa excuse Tampa. me, the, the <laughs> civilians in the, in the watermelon field in Tampa, Florida may have been surprised a little bit by, uh, by your reaction that morning. Uh, two of them were, one of them wasn't, uh, the reason they had given me that job is, <laughs> as, as you can think is cause I could read a map pretty well and I would find a plot of land where a power transmission line, a source of water and a gas line were all concurrent in the same location, we built a power plant right there. First step was to buy the land. So we were a bit of a clandestine group of four who would go around and make a survey of this area and offer the farmer some money for it. Now, one of the members of that team was a former Marine Corps sniper from Vietnam. He, un he understood exactly what was going on. And as we got that information, and of course all the airways and airlines shut down that day, nothing was flying, there was no way to fly home, we called a rental car company and said, well, we're, we're going to take this, drive this rental car back to Birmingham. And they said, well, no, you're going to have to turn that in. And we said, have a nice day, drove back to Birmingham. <laughs> sure. So they were, they were the other team members were very grateful that I'd gotten them home during the, you know, the same day without going through the hassle a lot of people did. Absolutely. So 
I imagine you made it to uh, to Fort Bragg within 24 hours of. Uh... It took a little longer than that, not because of the need, but because of the bureaucracy. Uh, it ended up that I was one of the first three people mobilized, and you can't really mobilize somebody on a phone call. Uh, you have to check a few blocks and t- make a few phone calls. I called the state headquarters of Montgomery, Alabama, and said, I've been mobilized. They said, well, we don't have that paperwork yet. And I said, well, Turn on I'll the TV. see when I get to Fort Bragg. <laughs> and in fact, uh, there are two other special operations generals and myself. Our orders or our mobilization actually says Operation Infinite Justice that day. And if you recall the history, um, the advisors told President Bush he couldn't call it that because only all of dispenses justice so later that day of enduring freedom. So oh, wow. my so orders that, for some they, operation that nobody knows about. Me and two other guys were off doing something they don't know, but we were at Fort Bragg. Well, so they, they changed the name of the operation that day after over, over some wording. Correct. It was politically... Uh, unattractive to do something that was anti-Islamic, which they recognized right away. So that's, you know, recognition of the of the religious and political sensitivity of the issue within 24 hours of the incident. Uh, yeah, I thought it was really interesting, and I didn't even really reflect on it till later because I didn't I didn't know this had happened for months and months and months. But when they came, started handing out service records and, and giving credit for for days served. I wasn't on the list and with these two other guys because while we were at Fort Bragg and we were being paid at Fort Bragg, the, the bigger military didn't understand what they had done to us. We were kind of lost as a, as a single point of light. So what, what capacity were you serving in once you got to Fort Bragg? You were still the deputy commanding general, but, um, but what, what exactly were you doing once you got there? Uh, well, I was standing in for the two-star when he wasn't there. Uh, the two-star commander was Jeff Lambert at the time. He and I had known each other for quite a while, um, and he had—he did not—he wasn't the one that selected me. He succeeded my selector, a guy named General Frank Tony, moved on to other other assignments, and General Lambert took over. I was—I was his right hand. Uh, when you see the movie, the new movie Twelve Strong, and the whole saddle episode. Uh, I was part of that where the saddles were dropped into Afghanistan because the horses that Dostum provided, ODA 595, the saddles were wooden. Wow. They were really uncomfortable. And it's not, it's not depicted in the movie, but if you read the book, you'll, you'll read that. So from day one, I was thrown into the mix. But the burning question was, we're going, he, and General Lambert said to me, we're going to put National Guard elements into the fight. How do we do that? And the second question from his boss upstairs, both of our bosses, uh, General Doug Brown, three-star commander of Army Special Operations, or Army Special Operations, the whole package. General Brown asked me, what's it going to cost? So those are two gigantic questions. And I provided them a strategy that allowed the National Guard elements to continuously replenish. In other words, a three-for-one concept, one deployed, one getting ready to deploy, one recovering from deployment. Okay. And just keep, keep rolling them over. We could do that for decades. So your your job was to create something that was sustainable long term and something that worked functionally and and had a had a budget at least. Exactly. And of course the you know the months the the weeks after nine eleven we didn't know how long this was going to last. It might last one iteration. It might last fifty iterations. Sure. So and my, and my I mean my previous guest noted that as well. He he said he was thinking about getting back in and. But he remembers the you know Gulf War, early '90s, and we weren't in a lot of long conflicts, and people expected stuff to go a lot faster. As yeah, a we, of uh, we both talked about it. We d- we didn't expect it to fall quite so quickly, uh, the, the Taliban at least. But then, as we realized later on in the follow-on of Iraq in 2003, there was still a need for these National Guard special operations elements. So the longevity plan worked like a champ. Now I got a lot of pushback because folks wanted to go to the battle right away. And there were some that were ready, and there's some weren't ready, and the guys that weren't ready had to go on a later rotation. So what kind of indicators were you looking for then as, as to who was ready to go and who wasn't? Uh, uh, there's seven special forces group, five active and two National Guard. And for most of the two-star commanders of special forces command, they simply treated them as seven groups. So when he got his semi-annual training brief, from special forces to the briefings for from National Guard units. 
So the five active groups would brief their readiness. The two National Guard groups would then brief theirs. So we had a pretty clear picture of how big the differences were and what was going to need, be needed to get these two guard units up to the same level of equipping. And training was, was solid. That the training and the training tests anybody wanted to give us, the results were comparable. Wasn't much difference in the training levels, but the equipping level was gap was gigantic because we'd suffered through the Clinton years where the Guard and Reserve simply didn't get the same equipment that the active duty had. In fact, at, at one point early on, we were five generations of radio radios behind the active duty guys. Five generations. That's... Uh... I think there just, are ROTC units and cadets that aren't five generations behind. That's right. And it was one of those enormous problems they uncovered that they vowed never to let happen again. But five generations of radios means that the, lat, the latest radios can't talk to the oldest radios. That's unacceptable. Well, so when they, I showed General Brown, he went in my office and closed the door. He said, how the hell could this happen? I said, well, because our leadership that funds the Pentagon has failed to fund the whole Pentagon. They cut the corners, and the corners they cut are called the Guard and Reserve, and that's where we are today. And he said, are you sure about this? I said, absolutely, I'm certain. So how so quickly God did that recover? The Pentagon, uh, General Brown was very influential. He was a former commander of uh, JSOC at, at the time. He just went to the Pentagon and said, here's what it's going to take. And, and they, they believed him. We didn't have to fight our way through a bunch of bureaucratic trenches. Well, that's... Uh... At least they believed him, and, and you could act quickly. How how uh, how quickly did it take to get those units up to speed and ready to go with equipment? Day, days and weeks. Um, we had the ability within special operations with some supplemental funding as well to make on-the-spot purchases. And we literally went to Cabela and Bass Pro Shop and North Face and bought stuff we needed right off the shelf. And, and radios. We actually took some of the radios that were currently slated to go to other services like the Marines and the Navy and gave them to the guys who were deploying because that just made the most sense. And so how quickly did you, uh, did you go over to Afghanistan after nine 11? Uh, it was a couple of weeks, several weeks. There were several events unfolding over there. There was just a heck of a lot of supervision folks from, from the Pentagon. People just didn't believe that, Special Forces teams alone could could sway this battle. So there was a long discussion about conventional units deploying into Afghanistan and setting up fire bases like they had in Vietnam. There was a lot of, here's how we used to do it, thought process, so we're going to do it again. And as a result, there was a little bit of a holdback on how we're going to supply Special Forces because we're going to need to send the, you know, the 10th Mountain and the 101st over there to conquer the country. Didn't turn out that way. But the good news is special operations is somewhere less than 1% of the budget of the Pentagon, or right at 1%. So when you ask them for a chunk of change to equip all of special forces, you're really not asking for much in the big mix of things. And especially so at that time, there wasn't a huge amount of equipment on the ground that was required to be maintained or, uh, or moved there over was, there. These were very there, lightweight units. Oh, there was none. I mean, it was what you could carry. In fact, um, the first echelons that went in, the way, the way Task Force Dagger unfolded, uh, it was built around initially Air, For Air Force rescue crews flown into Karshi Khanabad, Uzbekistan. Uh, Karshi Khanabad was an old Soviet fighter base. It was just across the border from Afghanistan because there wasn't enough infrastructure in Afghanistan to support lines of communication. There were no serviceable roads. There were no real, that we didn't know anything about the airfields at all. So the idea initially was the Air Force would rescue their own pilots from Uzbekistan. Well, when the 5th Special Forces Group got there, the two colonels, the Air Force colonel and the Army colonel, looked at each other, and the Air Force colonel quite correctly said, looks to me like you ought to be in charge and I'll be your backup because it turned out to be an Army activity, not so much an Air Force activity. And that happened on a handshake in Uzbekistan. And the fifth special, fifth special Forces Group commander took command of what was what we call Task Force Dagger, which was all the assets of Navy, Army, and Air Force, the Army and the Navy SEALs on the ground, and the Air Force in support, which turned out to be a winning combination because to get into Afghanistan was an air mobility problem. 
a problem because of distance and altitude. There were altitudes that we that the helicopters flew over that helicopters are not meant to fly over. So there was risk in every flight, and it took two or three refuelings to go in and two or three refuelings to get back because it was so far. The only helicopters at the time that could do that were those of the 160th Aviation Regiment, which is a special operations aviation because they have refueling probes. And so... With air refueling helicopters, uh, the the 160th CH-47 Chinooks that have those refueling probes, uh, they were able to to use those to insert special forces teams into uh, into northern Afghanistan from Uzbekistan in September and October in 2001. Correct. Correct. Beginning in October, there was quite a bit of political pressure from the, the leadership in Washington to get them in now. But frankly, there were some weather delays which you couldn't overcome because. The helicopters were beyond their flight envelope over these mountains in good weather. To put them over those mountains in bad weather would have been an extremely bad choice. So the the task force dagger commander had to keep holding off and say, we need a window where we can get the aircraft in and aircraft out, because all this had to be done at night um, under night vision goggles, so no li- lights out operation. Uh, part of the reason for that is that we were concerned at the time that a lot of the anti-aircraft missiles that had been provided to the Taliban to fight the Soviets were unaccounted for. And both the Army and Air Force were concerned that those anti-aircraft missiles could be used against our aircraft. So all the flights were at night by the Army. The Air Force and its Air Control Command of the day uh, created, a, I think it was a 30,000-foot glass floor the Air Force aircraft could not fly under because it was too dangerous. And one of the jobs I got assigned to was to go find some of these missiles and buy them back so that we could clear the battlefield of of aircraft threats and bring closer air support down to the ground ground soldiers. But the ground soldiers hit the ground anyway. You can can know from the the horse soldier charge and 595, 574, 555, they got on the ground pretty quick because we wanted to support the anti-Taliban forces General Dostum, General Atta, others who had guerrilla forces of their own fighting the Taliban. And so, what to to get it? I guess more to a little bit more of a micro level, so so folks understand. What does a special forces team showing up in Afghanistan at that time look like? Uh, a special forces team is supposed to be twelve guys: two guys in the lead, a captain and a warrant officer, two medics, two heavy weapons, two light weapons, two commo guys, and two medics. And the reason there's two of those is you can take this 12-man team and actually split it into one team of six or two teams of six with almost comparable skill sets. In addition, if we had it available, we assigned an Air Force uh, tactical air control person, a guy who directs aircraft bombs to each team. He's had the radio to talk to the Air Force. He had the uh, target laser target designator to call the bombs in. When you hit the ground, it's whatever you can carry. You're getting, you're running off. a Chinook, you're running down the ramp with a rucksack that weighs almost as much as you do, all the weapons that you're going to need and all the ammunition you can carry. Because we were uncertain as to whenever that helicopter could get back there. You were eight or nine hours away from assistance because of the length of the flight. And so what these teams are going in in groups with particular missions. They were responsible for seizing and holding particular pieces of terrain or airfields or linking up with uh so what did that look like the the introduction of special forces was dependent on uh, the cia's jawbreaker teams which actually got in very early these are one or two man teams extremely courageous guys who got into country one way or the other sometimes by high altitude parachutes linked up with one of the anti-taliban commanders like dostum of which there were several and the idea was to send those special forces ODA to each of those major anti-Taliban forces to be his liaison with American fire support. Okay, so there were there predetermined no, no, link-up points. We, we were hoping to rid the country of the Taliban, but we were one of the special forces' mottos is fighting by, with, and through others. We were fighting with the anti-Taliban forces of the ATF through the soldiers that they had. Okay. So 12 guys might be able to direct a fighting force of 5,000 indigent soldiers. And that happened over and over again in those months following September. Correct, in the first 100 days. 
in 100 days, we're able to drive the Taliban out of the country and some of their major strongholds that they control. Mazari Sharif was one of those. Kandahar was another. Bagram was another. And so you mentioned uh, a few minutes ago that that happened faster than expected. What what do you think caused that to happen so quickly? <clears throat> and a really good histology of this is the 12 Strong movie where you have some American Special Forces folks who in their back pocket have all the advanced technology that America has to offer linked up with somebody who knows the battlefield very well. The battle commanders of the Allied anti-Taliban forces talked regularly to the Taliban leaders on the walkie-talkie. They would curse each other and talk about their families, and they're, they're across the valley looking at each other. So our friends, the anti-Taliban forces, like Dostum, knew the enemy. They knew the terrain. They knew the strong points. They knew what they had to conquer in order to drive the Taliban from their homeland. So we created the link to the technology we brought to the view of the battlefield that they had. And the the massive air power and air superiority that, that the Special Forces teams were able to bring to bear in that fight was also a huge factor, I would imagine. It, it was it was amazing. It um at first the leadership that we linked up with, you know, Autumn uh, Ada, Ada and Dostum didn't believe we were there to help, didn't believe we'd be able to help, didn't believe 12 guys would be of any assistance to their 4, 400 or 4,000 fighters, depending on what the force was. And they were kind of put through some some show-me-your-best kind of test where the, the indigent commander, indigenous commander, not indigenous, indigenous commander, would say, you know, I need, we need to attack that hill over there, so we're going to ride down this valley on horses and attack uphill. And the Americans say, well, let's let's think about that for a second. Why don't we lay some bombs down over there and weaken that opposing force before we ch- go charging up this open field? And they, the anti-Taliban generals would just say, okay, show me. We don't, we don't think you can shoot your guns from here to there. And the Americans would respond with, we're not shooting our guns. We're going to bring some planes in and we're going to drop some bombs on it. Well, they'd never seen any of this before. They had no idea how this was going to work. So... The explosions they were expecting were probably small and hand grenade size. Uh, technology brought to the battlefield laser target designators and GPS guided bombs that could land on a pinpoint. So when the special forces team put the laser tar- target designator on a vehicle and said to someone like General Dostum, watch that vehicle over there on the right. It's going to disappear. And 30 seconds later, it would. And from their medieval experience and running across these fields on horseback this was magic yeah i think uh an accurate quote here I, i'm not exactly sure where i heard this but it's uh technology sufficiently advanced to the uneducated looks like magic yes exactly that's exactly what it was um of course then the reality is the planes at thirty thousand feet you couldn't see or hear they were too too high you drop a gravity bomb, which has GPS-guided fins on it. By the time it gets to the ground, it's fallen vertical, and the plane is flown for 30 seconds. So it's it's out. It's completely not in the neighborhood when the bomb hits. So they really didn't know how these things were getting blown up. But the fact that the Special Forces guys could pick a spot and deliver deadly fire on a particular spot was pretty enthralling. And it wasn't long after several of these little tests, if you will, that Dostum and the other generals began to protect the Americans because they realized if the Americans get killed, this will stop. Absolutely. I mean, that's the Americans are their ace in the hole, their massive technological advantage. It took episodes of Show Me for them to realize that was the case. Now, daylight bombing had to be done by B-52s at altitude. Uh, later on in the war, the A-10s didn't get there till April because the air envelope was not clear. But the special operations gunships, the AC-130s, uh, operated at night uh, some months before that, and they were very effective as well. Same technologies link up as well. And so, and, and just to be clear about what, what kind of advantage an AC-130 gunship brings to the fight, uh, an AC-130 gunship is one of the most powerful air fire support platforms in existence. 
So that it that is. that being it's in the air car- above a special a cargo, forces team, it's a cargo plane full of guns and ammunition that fires from the sky with pinpoint accuracy. And it has a 105 millimeter howitzer poking out the side of it. As that has 40 millimeter Bofors cannons and several 23 millimeter Gatling guns. Uh, they're all computer controlled. They all calculate lead, wind speed, distance, temperature, so that the the azimuth of fire is corrected, so it's rounds on target almost with the first round. And so the leadership challenge in all of this is getting those kinds of assets to the people who need to use them as quickly as possible, correct? It is. And over history, uh, beginning with the debacle at uh, Eagle One in the Tehran, in the desert north of Tehran in Iran, where we found the services did not work well together, uh, joint special operations went on a growth pattern to make sure that we knew how to fight joint forces. Air Force assets helping Army elements, Marine assets helping Navy elements, all of us being talking the same language with the same expectations, bringing all our tools to the table. That link-up provided effective fires from Air Force gunships to ground requesters that belonged to the Army. And we practiced that. It wasn't Afghanistan that started this. By the time we got to Afghanistan, this was pretty much a perfect marriage. And the Joint Special Operations Command uh, at, at Fort Bragg controls all of the special operations elements. Or I'm sorry, SOCOM in Tampa uh, commands all of those. In fact, that was my last assignment, was in, all, in charge of all the reserve components assigned to special operations worldwide. So so, it's a pretty good marriage, and we force the Navy to participate in Army exercises and the Army to participate in Air Force exercises so that we find the disconnects and we find the misunderstandings and we get those corrected in practice. So when we go to the big game, we know how this works, and it worked like a champ in Afghanistan. And so the the methods that Special Forces teams are using to engage the enemy and and to bring to the fight all of this technological advantage, that was something well-practiced at that point, and that was a readiness status that was... Uh, effectively good to go before 9-11 happened? We had no doubt that it would work. And I think if you go back to the the beginning where I started some of this story, the Air Force Special Operations Air and Rescue Colonel looked at the guy coming in, the Army Special Forces Colonel, and said, this looks like more of a ground fight. Why don't you be in charge and I'll be your deputy? It was that kind of personal relationship where a man was eager to give up command because he saw the battlefield unfolding. And those, those yeah, individual right. decisions are so important in the moment in that fight, well, too. We know each other. We trust each other. It's not the first time we've met one another. And as a result, you get a lot of cooperation. And so during this time, you personally were bouncing back and forth between Fort Bragg, North Carolina, and uh Afghanistan, correct? Correct. What did that cycle look like month to month for you? It was it was needs based. Um, we did have a, a bomb go astray and kill some of our own soldiers. A friendly fire incident, and they needed a general officer to go investigate that because it, it really ruffled a lot of feathers when people were accusing one force of hurting another force. Um, that gave me an opportunity to get between the two and find out what really happened. It turned out to be an equipment malfunction. It wasn't necessarily a human error. Something we didn't understand about the equipment that we it cost us dearly to learn. Um, there was a lot of activity at the Pentagon when you start calling up reserve forces. Um, everybody gets excited. I'd have to go explain that to the Pentagon and to Congress about why reserves and guard forces were essential to the fight uh, and what they needed, the, the equipping of those forces. Um, there was a lot of consternation in the Pentagon. I think there was a reputation that reserves and guards weren't up for this kind of fight. I think that's pretty much dispelled at this point. But those voices had a lot of a lot of sway at first. That you get a guy killed who he left home. He was a banker. He ends up dead in Afghanistan. How are we going to explain that? Well, he signed up for this. In fact, one of the worst casualties that I had to deal with. I did uh, funerals for 27 individuals since 9/11. One of the worst was a guy who was an E-6 in Special Forces. He was a medic. He got killed in Afghanistan. But in his civilian life, he was an emergency room physician. He had he'd given that career up to join the Army to become a medic in Special Forces, and it cost him his life. And that's the quality of people that you see 
uh, those who are willing to sacrifice for others. And the, the battlefield abounds with stories like that. Yeah, I think that when people imagine the flag-draped coffin and the military funeral, they don't picture someone who left home from Alabama as a high school teacher because they got called up in a guard unit. Uh, they, they picture the career soldier. They picture the people, you know, the families living on military bases separated from the rest of society. Uh, and in the National Guard, especially in, in special operations where your National Guard involvement is typically a little bit more involved, a little bit higher likelihood of deployment. Uh, that's a little bit of a different story when it's those National Guard units and those, those special operations soldiers that are uh, in that situation. It, it is. Um, of the, the funerals I have done, I, I haven't had a, a family survivor tell me this was the wrong thing to do. They're, they're very proud of this lost service member, and they're very cognizant of how much he gave up so that others might have the freedoms we enjoy. But all of us, in special operations in particular, have talked this over with our families and explained to them that this is really a dangerous business, and that when the phone rings, no matter how quickly supper might be ready, I got to go. That phone call is more important because it has a national aspect to it. And that's the sacrifice the family makes, which in some cases is bigger than the soldier. Um, one of the problems, personal problems I had when I did these funerals was that at the time, the leadership only gives you one flag per casualty, one American flag to be handed to the survivors. Well, if the kid has a wife he certainly has a mother. That's two females. Who's, who am I going to give this flag to? And it was a question I couldn't answer, so I went out and bought extra flags. Uh, the first funeral I did was for four guys who had gotten blown up in an explosion and were in a casket together, four sets of remains in one casket. And there were four flags, but there were seven surviving females. So I sent my aide downtown with the credit cards to get me three more flags. And we draped the coffin with the first flag. I presented it to the first widow, and I came back and got the second flag and presented it to the mother who lost a son. And we did that six times at Arlington Funeral, or Arlington Cemetery, because uh, it's just the right thing to do. Um, we're all in this together. In fact, uh, when a Special Forces soldier is, is killed at the funeral, a Special Forces general officer presides. We send someone to do that. And I've, I've even paid my own way to go to one of those funerals because we couldn't work out the details of the Pentagon. So I just whipped out my credit card and did it in Texas. That's probably the most difficult extra duty an officer can possibly do. Well, it's particularly difficult for me because when I was 10 years old, they handed me my father's flag. So I'm bought into this 100%. It's an intensely, an intensely personal experience every time then. It is incredibly emotional and a lot of people like to use it for other purposes we uh, we had a funeral in massachusetts and politicians wanted well politicians wanted to walk with the casket and i asked them if they knew the family and they said no and i said well then you're, you're not walking with the casket that's not for you to do it was at that same funeral that these uh, religious zealots from the westboro baptist church tried to get involved and protest the funeral and said that the kid deserved to die they didn't get a warm reception in Massachusetts, nor have they gotten a warm reception in most any other place. Yeah, I can't imagine what that feeling is like for the family, especially at that point in time when uh, it's in the middle of, it's the biggest thing in the news. There's protesters and politicians at a funeral. It's, you know, they've just lost a loved one. That, that's got to be one, an unbelievably uh, invading experience for the family. The, the the one I was the ones I was involved in, we were very successful in screening the family from those intruders. And of course, I had I was surrounded by special forces guys who were helping us out, and it was real clear to, to them and to me by telling them we're we're standing in this doorway, and nobody comes in to disturb the family. That's an order, and they follow it. Probably the best people on earth to follow those kinds of orders too. I didn't have to tell them twice. <laughs> I I did have to stop a few from going down and taking on the Westboro Baptist folks. They wanted to go down and take care of that. I said, no, we're, we're not going to go that far. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a, a difficult and very thin line. Uh, uh, along at that same funeral, I had to tell the, the uh, Patriot Guard, the Patriot Riders, the motorcycle guys, that they couldn't do that either, that they were limited by my order not to beat up any Westboro Baptist members. 
they've pulled off some amazing uh amazing support to military funerals across the ac- across the country and for for the last you know nearly two it, decades it, it, and despite what you read in the press, I think it really shows the heart of America that yeah, these are lost heroes, and we're going to honor them. Regardless of what you read in the print, this is what we're going to do. It's powerful to experience that firsthand. Going back a little bit to some of these uh, deployed special forces teams and how quickly did we get a large number of people over there from the special operations community? And then what kind of, what did their, their experience look like? Historically, when you go through the special forces qualification course or the Q course, your concluding exercise is an unconventional war exercise north of Fort Bragg in the Uari forest in a fictional country called Pineland. And every special forces soldier who's ever graduated has to go through this exercise and prove that he can effectively work with an unconventional force. To that end, the schoolhouse at Fort Bragg, special forces schoolhouse, has paid and hired actors to act as guerrilla f- forces in in the forest. And every class, they send elements of the 82nd or- Airborne to try to find the special forces students and capture them. That whole exercise is built around the fact that you have to establish rapport with whoever you find in the area that you think is friendly and sympathetic to your cause and make them an effective fighting force that survives. What's different about Afghanistan? You fly into an area, you meet a guy you never met, he doesn't speak English, you draw a couple of maps in the dirt, and you march off riding his pony. It was so classic, exactly what we had taught them in the Pineland exercise was exactly what they encountered in Afghanistan because it's universal. And it's really winning the hearts and minds early, saying we're here to help, here's what we can do, what are your objectives, here are our objectives. And you sit down and you reach consensus over tea that has stuff floating in it or the you know the best goat's eyeballs they've had all month are yours for the taking. <laughs> in fact, um, there was a bridge over the border, the river between Afghanistan and Uzbekistan that was not open for traffic because the two tribes on either side couldn't agree to how to use a bridge. An Army Special Forces captain got the two leaders to agree to meet in the bridge, set up a table and drank tea till he got it open. It was an 03. He's 25 years old. Negotiated a deal between two countries that diplomats had been un- unable to do for decades. And one of the preeminent skill sets of the special forces guys that you listen. You listen to what this guy's telling you. Now, that may mean you have to rub shoulders with some shady characters from time to time. In fact, I spent a whole bunch of time living in the the, uh, governor's palace in Kandahar. This guy's name was Sharzai, and he was pretty much a thug. He ruled by force and intimidation. But the fact that he could make change and get things done means that we had to convert him into an ally. And, And we did over time. Uh, that was one of the most rewarding experiences of my life because it was while I was there at his, his uh, governor's palace that we saw the first little girls go to school because that was a, a death sentence in Afghanistan at the time. The Taliban enforced that. How quickly did you start seeing change like that after the initial special operations soldiers <laughs> kind of took? There t- was a, it, it was really kind of interesting. It, it was pretty much as you would expect, in that they didn't know what we were there for. It could have been just as clearly that we're your new conquerors and we're going to take your resources and kill your women and children. So there was a period of observation where they watched what we did, and it wasn't too long before they decided that we were there to help, that we weren't interested in taking their money, we weren't interested in taking their mules, we weren't interested in, in stealing from them. And in fact, once we interceded in a few squabbles and conflicts, they realized that they could prosper under this new set of rules. It was literally days in some places. In fact, in Kandahar, um, it was maybe two or three days before the bazaars opened back up and began to barter goods and services, you know, food for spices, spices for bicycle tires, bicycle tires for clothing. And the reason they had to barter was because the Taliban drained the bank of currency. They took all the money when they left town. But that didn't stop the Afghans. They got started right away. 
Uh, from my my personal experience in Afghanistan, I do not know of of many more resourceful people than Afghans I met on deployments. Well, if you had to have a national treasure in Afghanistan, it would be rocks because they got nothing. It, they got nothing. Noth- nothing but ingenuity and survivability, toughness. Uh, and they're smart. They not, might not are. be well dressed, but they're really doggone pretty smart. One of my favorite and, stories to tell about that that kind of ingenuity and figure out how to live in, in, in a place like that is, is that when we rolled a vehicle into one of the little irrigation ditches next to, you know, some dirt road on some mountain road somewhere in Northeastern Afghanistan, we called for wrecker services. And these are the big MRAPs, the mine resistant ambush protected vehicles with the V holes and mm-hmm. uh, massive, you know, getting that thing rolled back over is no small task. Mm-hmm. And so we called for the huge wrecker and we're in a bad spot and got a ETA of an hour and a half. And that was, that was not going to be a good afternoon if we had to sit in one spot for 90 minutes there. And so I got out of the truck with a uh, hundred dollars in twenties and started talking to the people who at this point walked up to see what was going on. And I started waving a hundred dollars in twenties around. And before you knew it, we had six tractors out on the road uh, <laughs> about, 10 donkeys or mules and all sorts of different ropes and lines hooked up to the truck. And it was back on four tires on the road within about 25 minutes. Yeah. $100 spent. I think the word that you use resourceful is exactly the right word. I mean, they lived with, with active minefields and conquering forces and brutality for the longest time. And they've adapted they're there to survive, and you just got to credit them because there's just nothing to eat, nothing grows, the rivers are dry. Oh my gosh! If you could think of a worse place to be, I don't know where it would be, but they're tough. They are very tough. They're living in connexes. Uh, families it, have cut a hole in a connex, and that's where they live—a steel shipping container. And because it's easy to drop. And up up into the mountains, you see some of the most hardy people on the face of the earth. Mm-hmm. The Nuristan province and, and up in that area in the far northeastern corners of, of Afghanistan near the Pakistan border is uh, is a very, very hard place to live and some of the most extreme terrain on the planet. Yeah, it's just it's, you can't you can't haul yourself up at much less all your equipment. And, and that's what these special forces teams were fighting through uh, was, was this crazy terrain um, with. Uh, you know, a tribal people that have ancient ways and are in some ways one of the most unconquerable groups of people in history. Yeah. Well, that's uh, one of your earlier guests I was listening to this morning was talking about, you know, if you want to teach them to be physically fit and they don't want to do jumping jacks, I think you have to realize that that's an American solution. Well, why don't we see what the Afghan solution is? Because the outcome we're looking for is that they be physically fit. The method they do that really is not, it's inconsequential. So you have to kind of throw off your, this is the way we expect you to do it, and ask yourself and ask them, show me how you would do this. And you'd be surprised. You'd be very surprised at how they do it. So how did those special forces teams move through that terrain and and move to their objectives quickly and effectively uh, during that first six months, or I guess, hundred days after uh, after nine eleven. Initially, initially it was it was foot by foot. You went with whatever transportation your force commander had. In the case of Dostum, he had he had some horses, and he lent, if you will, the ODA that arrived there five nine five horses. Now, some of the others didn't have that luxury. Some were a ragtag trail of old Toyota pickup trucks. So that's what you got. And you moved as the force you were with moved. Later on, we were able to to actually provide Toyota pickups, which were pretty robust at the time. And these these gators you see on farms, these small four wheel vehicles you can haul stuff in. We got some of those into the battlefield over time because you could fit those into a helicopter for the heavier equipment. Because we uh, you realize that you get off the helicopter with just your rucksack on, food, water, and ammunition for yourself. That's not very impressive. <laughs> You've no. got to bring some other resources to bear. And we began to do uh, additional flights in at night of things as simple as, as horse feed. Uh, water was very unavailable, so it had to be replenished continuously. And I'm a big believer in bullets. So just bring me more bullets and I'll make do. 
Yeah, that's uh, that's probably one of the most difficult challenges of that type of warfare is how do you keep an unconventional force who's spread out thin across the battlefield in unbelievably difficult terrain with a uh, a lot of decision making ability on their own on the ground as to where they go next. You know, the, the challenge is how do you keep a force like that resupplied over and over for months? We didn't do that very well at first. Uh, of course, the our, our one of our solutions going in was to airdrop supplies because you could do that from an aircraft at thirty thousand feet. But as you might imagine, it doesn't always land where you want it to. And as you pointed out, the resourceful Afghani's realized that these weren't bombs dropping; this was stuff, and they pretty much were on the lookout for parachutes all the time because it meant that stuff was going to arrive, whether it's boots or blankets or bullets. I wonder what they thought. The wonder where they thought that was coming from. They don't know. Have no idea. But they, <laughs> and they they thanked Allah for it, and that's all they needed to do. Because then then you'd find it for sale in the village later on that day. Sure. And you'll see that in the movie Twelve Strong. That's exactly what happened. We were buying our own stuff back from them. Um, some of those did land where they're supposed to. Uh, the technology's improved to the point now we were we were experimenting with something at Fort Bragg, which are actually GPS uh, guided parachutes flyable parachutes that you could program a location into and it would land there. So you just didn't drop a string of parachutes and cross your fingers and hope the winds didn't catch them. Uh, but also, uh, we got more and more aviation support and were able to fly more Chinook flights into country. But that was a long flight and the Chinooks weren't really built for that, so we didn't squander them on that if possible. And uh, so after now, that... Let- after Let me that, add one more thought to that. Oh, one, sure. one of our one of our uh, long range goals, I mean long range, like thirty day goals, was to make sure that we had control of some of these serviceable airfields so we could resupply by air land rather than airdrop. And that that's what I was going to get into next is how quickly did it go from you know soldiers on horseback or in Toyota trucks to Airland, uh, you know, airfields secured and starting to set up more bases of operation. Within days, as soon as we could get a team in to evaluate a runway or a set of runways to the Air Force's satisfaction, we'd fly in. In fact, we built up a, a significant presence in Mosuri Sharif, which is in the northern part of the country, because it had a very long runway. And as soon as we could secure the runway and make sure that it wouldn't damage our aircraft, we began to fly fixed wing air land supplies in, which is a giant resource to do, to be able to do that. But then those are limited to the bigger cities, Bagram, Kandahar, Masri Sharif, not, not too many others were you able to do that. Yeah. And just to explain that a little bit, flying fixed wing, which we're talking about uh, propeller and jet aircraft, that cargo planes that can hold a significant amount, significantly larger amount of, of supplies than uh, than Chinook helicopters. Some of those cargo planes are actually large enough to hold Chinook helicopters themselves. They are. They are. In fact, if, if you're talking about a C-130, a four-propeller turboprop plane, it can hold Humvee-sized vehicles. If you can get a, a C-17 jet uh, cargo plane in there, it can actually haul a tank. Not not just wood, but I'm saying the, the size perspective is significantly different. Your, your capability goes up dramatically. And so that was a major priority in those first 30, 40, 50 days is, is ensure the ability to bring fixed wing aircraft in to, to right. air land supplies. If you do a, a campaign assessment, one of the questions you have, you have to ask yourself what you want to do. You have to ask yourself, can I do it? Then you have to ask yourself, can I sustain it? Which ends up being the fulcrum point for most operations. If you can't sustain it, you can't do it. And the ability to, to command the landing rights or, or the ability to land on these airfields safely and get the aircraft off safely uh, was, was a critical improvement in providing resources to the forces on the ground. And this is all uncontrolled airspace. I mean, there's no control tower or anything like that. It's a piece of concrete, literally. No markers on the runway, nothing you'd expect at Atlanta International. It's a piece of concrete. You kind of have to know where it is to land on it. And so you had you know, special forces teams on the ground trying to mark airfields and certify airfields. Uh, Correct. To get it's one of the one of the skill sets of special operations training. I was uh, the, one of the C one thirties that I flew in on was the I think the first C one thirty in Bagram, 
and we we took a picture of ourselves on the ramp, and as soon as we did, we took incoming fire, so we left. <laughs> and that flight into Bagram is uh, it'll make the hairs on the back of your neck stand up. Uh, it will. It's not a friendly kind of deal. Um, in fact, even landing in Uzbekistan, the Air Force took evasive defensive actions on the landing pattern. I forget what they call it, but they start from a high altitude and spiral down in a real tight circle and kind of literally slam the plane into the runway. So they're not exposed for any length of time. And one of the flights that we came in on, we hit so hard, the computer said this aircraft is unavailable <laughs> until, <laughs> until it's recertified. There's not a lot you can do on the ground at that time to to recertify some of those aircraft either. Uh, well, yeah, they had to fly in somebody from another country to certify it. There wasn't anybody qualified to do it there, so it sat off to the side for a couple of weeks or a couple of days. And so now, now some of those air bases like Bagram and Kandahar are effectively functioning cities or military bases. At that time, they were just stripped airfields, correct? Exactly. We you start you ask about setting up bases as a natural progression. If this is where the planes are landing and this is where the the supplies are being offloaded, it becomes a base. You have to protect those. So those airheads, if you will, became the the biggest of the fire bases, and that's where the conglomeration of forces began to grow. Is because we're we're going to be right here where the air air landing spot is. And so. From from this, you know, first uh, first hundred days or so, the first uh, really the first six months in Afghanistan, as as massive amounts of uh, troops, by comparison at that point in time, a large number of conventional troops started to move into the uh, into the country. How did how did the special forces mission transition from kick the Taliban out of Afghanistan into uh, what it became after that? Well, this is this is kind of where our times in Afghanistan begin to overlap because while you can destroy the command structure of the Taliban and you can drive them out of the big cities, it takes a much larger force to drive them out of the terrain because that's where they went when they lost the cities. You know, they ran to the rural areas and they ran to the hills. So if you're going to completely eliminate them from the country, then you need larger conventional forces to physically do a sweep because you can't hold terrain unless you're standing on it. And there weren't enough special forces to do that. But to decapitate the leadership and make it a non-functional command and control type element so that you just have parts and pieces, uh, it took that first hundred days to do that. But the follow-on mop-up is not really a good term, but that's what it is, is when you turn the lights on in the kitchen, the cockroaches scatter. And policing those up is a very, very difficult task because they went everywhere. And that's the heart of, you know, that's the, the beginnings of insurgency as well. It is. And, and that's where they go then and try to convince the population that they're the better option. And sometimes they convince that population by force, by killing their, their wives and children. That's pretty convincing. And as a result, it's very hard to win hearts and minds when all you're bringing is transistor radios and, and some a couple of good bottles of water. And then you leave town and the Taliban in, comes in and kills your family. Um, that's, that's tough to bargain that way. And so that immediately became the, the major challenge was how do you, how do you get the population on your side to essentially root out and find the remaining, the remaining Taliban left? Exactly. It's a, it's a difficult time consuming manpower intensive task to do that. And as the situation has developed, we can be, we can see that we didn't completely do that. That they are extremely resilient in the in the ones and twos and threes in the outlying villages to retain their control of those villages, and they provide uh, strategic messaging by occasionally blowing up one of our soldiers or one of our vehicles, and that then preys on the public's perception here in this country that maybe we shouldn't be there. It's kind of Vietnam all over again in a lot of ways. And so, but that, that being said, and I think you said it earlier, mm -hmm. um, they might not be well-dressed, but they're very, very smart, very bright. So they can understand clearly what makes the American machine change courses. And if you get the public enraged at what's going on, then the soldiers will eventually be asked to leave. So sure. the government will retract those. So they understand that. And in that, in that process of trying to you root out insurgents that are that have gone to the hills essentially uh 
when does the you know one of the primary missions of special forces is is the partnered force capability you know Im- improving the improving the capabilities and improving the training of a partnered force uh how long did it take to transition to that mission for a lot of the special forces teams in afghanistan uh, minutes i mean we're talking about a, a 12 guys who would rather have the impact of 5000 guys so they quickly pass on rudimentary skill sets to those willing to be our allies and make sure they can protect them, protect themselves, A, so we don't have to do it, B, by default, they'll protect us also. But that's a never-ending challenge. You have to continue that training forever. It's a relationship. So that starts it's, day, you know, minute one on the ground and, and then slowly transitions to more official partnerships like the Afghan National Army partnered with a special forces team for training. So it starts essentially in the moment you make contact and then becomes more official and more regimented as you go. Yeah, correct. And it was a lesson I learned even in the National Guard that one of my objectives as a, as a commander was to make sure the unit functioned whether I was there or not. It's analogous to Afghanistan. I want to make sure the Afghans can protect themselves whether I, the Americans, are there or not. That's that's a tough road. Sure, and again, that's, that's well, the you challenge. Can't, what you can't, we have to build as a nation. But what they come from is a tribal background. They've never functioned in a selfless environment that goes beyond their own tribe. So, in the movie Twelve Strong, you'll see where General Dostum is very worried about General Ada's progress. Well, he's supposed to be an ally. Why is he worried about him? Well, they're tribal rivals. They have never gotten along. They just currently have a common enemy, the Taliban. And the question in their two minds is, what's going to happen after we conquer the Taliban? Are we going to be fighting each other again? And those relationships, especially the relationships built between the special forces team leaders and soldiers with the partnered force, the personal relationships are so key how how did that go, uh, or how long were those initial teams in Afghanistan? And then, uh, you know, eventually they need to go home and change out. Uh, but how, how long were they there? And then, I guess, how did that change out work as you start to rotate more teams in? The, the initial surge, all the teams that went in first were, were back home in about 100 days. And the teams that went in uh, went in with a different set of circumstances, and their objective was to continue the good relationships. As time has gone forward we tried to be very cognizant of which team served with which warlord. So when that team comes back up for a rotation, we make efforts to assign that team to the indigenous people they know. We don't send them to a new area. You send them back to the village they were in a year ago. And they're, they're welcomed as conquering heroes. Now that doesn't always work because there's a whole lot of you know, bureaucratic resistance and friction because I need two teams over here and three teams over there, and somebody out in the Pentagon just balances those out, when in fact you have to take a much more intellectual view of it and ask where's the team going to do the most good, and that is with the people they know and the people that know them. Uh, We had teams literally almost mutiny because they weren't going back to where they thought they should go. And some were reluctant to come out of country because they had developed these relationships that were ongoing. They said, hey, if if you'll extend our rotation, we'll just stay right here. So our bureaucratic process occasionally didn't serve us well. We took them out of areas where they were most effective, and we sent in a different team for our reasons, when in fact we probably should have considered their reasons. And those teams that, you know, they rotate out after 100 days, and there's the handover. Uh, Their cycles back and forth from there are several months at a time and uh, just kind of ongoing in a rotation and that you're essentially trying to rotate people back in where they've served before. But like you said, it's a challenge of assets against problems. It is. And it, it it doesn't work out as well as we hoped it would. In fact, they're of the seven special forces group. Even the groups that are signed to speak Mandarin Chinese in the first special forces out in, in uh, Oregon and Washington, they got around, they took a, a rotation in Afghanistan uh, for a couple of reasons, some of which were ours and that we had to distribute the combat experience we were going to gain. And the other was that their equipment's fresh and ready to go. 
whereas the guys who just come out of country were probably less equipped than they needed to be, and they frankly needed a rest. So all seven special forces groups got some time in the box up till about early 2003 when we began to get ready for the uh, Iraqi invasion, which sucked up a whole lot of teams to get ready for that out of the fifth group in particular. And so but it was funny, kind of funny, uh, even the seventh special group forces group, which has a South American orientation. Most of them are speak Spanish. They found some Spanish non-governmental agencies when they got to Afghanistan. It's hilarious. <laughs> That's, I bet that that was uh, a little bit unexpected. Uh, it wasn't planned that way, but it worked out pretty well. And uh, like any other Special Forces Q course graduate, they adapted. I mean, their English is their first language, and they have a secondary language of some assigned area. It didn't matter. You know, you're going to get along with these people one way or the other. And with the expertise in communication, uh, a language barrier is generally not going to be the major issue at hand. Not a major issue for us, and over time, uh, we developed a pretty effective cadre of translators who would work for us. Um, we always insist on some right seat, left seat time, some overlap between the outgoing team and the incoming team, where both teams are on the ground for a limited period of time to make new friends and, and pass off information. You just have to do that. And so changing gears a little bit, uh, Something that a perspective that so many people don't get is the senior leader decisions and senior leader perspective uh, during this period of time and really during any any conflict. So both deployed and in the states, what what kinds of decisions were you looking at or what what kinds of operations were you looking at where you had a, a decision making role? One of the one of the challenges of special operations in particular is you go in early, and as a result, you're basing your decisions on a lot of unknowns. Uh, you have a lot of assumptions you need to make. You have a strategy you'd like to implement. You have resources you hope will be effective, but there's a whole lot of unknowns. And frankly, we have to trust these leaders on the ground to make the call. You, you can't be back in the Pentagon and tell me whether you need water or bullets. The guy on the ground needs to tell me that, and I need to go find what he wants. And frankly, I would say the special operations leadership prides itself on making sure the guy on the ground is the decision maker. Um, that's not prevalent throughout the military. There's a whole lot of rules of engagement, and we need to look at this first, and you need to send us some PowerPoint slides. Oftentimes, we don't have time for that. You have to take whatever information you have in your hands at that moment, you have to make assumptions uh, of lethality and survivability, and can I extract these guys, or could I get a medical help, or if I'm not able to resupply them in the next 24 hours, do I send them with twice the resources I normally would, and make a decision. So you have some very accomplished decision makers who take enormous risk based on how they understand the battlefield. And... I'm humbled by the fact that these guys can make that level of decision and be right as many times as they are. In fact, the, the Afghan strategy really flowed out of the leadership, the colonel-level leadership of Task Force Dagger in Uzbekistan. Here's what we need to do, and here's how we're going to do it. And so, from now, I'll tell you that another interesting sideline to it, um, it's very difficult to get Washington to have confidence in that sometimes. In fact, when the Iraqi invasion began to spin up, the preparations began to spin up, we had some comments from those in Washington, not the Pentagon, but others, who said, yeah, we're just, we'll just land teams with these guerrilla forces just like we did in Afghanistan. And we're going, whoa, whoa, time out. You know, Afghanistan and Iraq are totally different. The strategy that's currently working in Afghanistan, fellows, will not work in Iraq. You're going to have to use this small surgical strategic force to do something different because there aren't any tribes in, it, in Iraq. Just a major assumption that was incorrect based on the leadership's lack of understanding of what the battlefield looked like. The Special Forces guys could see it. And fortunately, we prevailed, and you'll see that the Iraqi invasion was preceded by neutralization of high-value targets throughout the, the Iraqi desert, the missile sites and others, other areas. And so those, that transition from Afghanistan to Iraq and the, the 
overarching strategy, the special operations strategy, as well as the basics of logistics, personnel management, and the overall capability with regard to training and equipment. Like that, that's a pretty broad spectrum of ideas, but um, that, that's kind of where your head was at for most of that period of time. The difference is, and I guess and it's not meant to be as critical as it might sound, but we have a tendency in the American military to go do what we did last because it worked. Sure. And I think you'll find a lot of guys in special operations who will ask the question, what does this new environment look like and how can we succeed? And come up with a different answer every time. The hard part is selling that to the leadership that, hey, what we just did in Afghanistan, we won this in 100 days. That won't work in Iraq two years later. That will not work. Well, how significantly different or, or what was the major shift in the strategy from Afghanistan to Iraq at that time for special operations? Well, it, it wasn't a UW battle. It, it was, an, it was a, an arrayed conventional force of the Iraqi army that had weak points. And when you go to the war college, they, teach you, they talk about centers of gravity. Um, and defeating the center of gravity, nothing else really matters. Well, in Afghanistan, you had various centers of gravity. You had Taliban forces all over. Your ability to uh, address those forces were mixed because you had these mixed tribal elements of anti-Taliban fighters. In Iraq, you have an army you're facing. You have a conventional entrenched army with, with somewhat modern equipment with tanks and missiles and uh, radio communications, anti-aircraft assets. They had that. They didn't have that in Afghanistan. It's a completely different battlefield. So the centers of gravity for Iraq were how can you take away the Iraqis' leader ability to impact your forces? So first you have to take away his long-range weapons. Then you have to control the airspace. It's called air, air, do, air dominance. You have to dominate the airspace so you can't put anything in the air. And once you do that, then he's at your mercy. So it was a real different battlefield. Significantly more focused on direct action and analysis of the enemy's assets and removal of their most important assets. Exactly. And so those were many of the same soldiers going from previous deployments to Afghanistan and transitioning to that effort, especially in fifth group uh, in Iraq. Exactly the same guys. To, to a man, the same guys. And they understood that this was a different battlefield, and they prepped for a different battlefield, and they, they employed themselves to defeat the enemy in Iraq, not the enemy they had left in Afghanistan. It was different. And that direct action portion of, of the Iraqi, engage in, in, uh, Iraqi invasion was also executed pretty quickly. Uh, Our technology overwhelmed the Iraqis. Once we took away his uh, Saddam's ability to reach, his long-range reach of weapons, once those were taken out, once we uh, uh, secured air dominance, w which we did, like in, within 48 hours or, or three days, he couldn't put up any air resistance of what we wanted to do in the air, and it, it completely al it allowed us freedom of movement over the entire battlefield and air support whenever we wanted it, wherever we wanted it. And so that... that assets on the ground resupply question was a little bit easier to solve in, in Iraq than, than in Afghanistan. Much easier. As a more developed country, Iraq also had critical infrastructure, roads and highways and rail and whatnot that we could utilize. You didn't have any of that in Afghanistan. A completely different maneuver problem as well then. Absolutely. Changing the subject a little bit, we talked, we've talked kind of a lot about strategy and, and special operations teams and what they were doing in Afghanistan and then uh, following how, how that invasion of Iraq was, was very different. But for you, at some point, you're going to go back to your, back to your civilian job. You can't leave forever. So, so what did that kind of cycle look like, rotating off of active duty after a couple of years and getting back into a more normal rotation? Um, there are two parts, there are three parts to it. One is how the Army reacts to your departure. The second part is how your employer reacts to your arrival. And the third part is you, how you handle that transition. I would tell you that <laughs> reservists and guardsmen are almost pre-programmed to do that successfully because during the time you're a drill status guardman, you leave your coat and tie job on Friday, you put on some fatigues and camo paint, you run through the woods and shoot guns Saturday and Sunday, 
You go home, you wash your face, you show up at work on Monday in a coat and tie. You, you, you make this psychological transition time and time and time again. So for your personal attributes, most of the guardsmen and reservists make the personal transition very well. The Army doesn't still understand how difficult it is for reservists to make that transition in terms of pay and allowances and days of leave and turning in equipment. Uh, in fact, when I left Fort Bragg for my departure, my departure physical was a guy asking me how I felt. When I told him I felt fine, my physical exam was over. <laughs> they, really so they really don't know what my physical condition was when I left active That's duty. the most abbreviated physical I've ever heard of. Yeah, and I, and I was a general going through this. So you can imagine what happens to the privates and corporals. Um, your civilian employer who welcomes you back, that reception covers the waterfront. Some are happy to see you back. Some people didn't even know you were gone. Uh, some people penalize you for going. You come back and find your job filled by another person, which is against the law. It's a felony to do that. Some companies do it anyway. Uh, so you have to make your own way. The regards and the reservists are have a personality resilience that this may not be acceptable when I get back, but it's so important. I'm still going to do it. And so your experience coming back off of active duty, uh, well, my, what yeah, did my that company look like? is very supportive, and I had leadership who was very interested in military activities. In fact, I was for a long time I was a guest speaker at every executive conference and tell us how this how this battlefield is. Tell us what's going on. Tell us what our other employees are going to experience if they go do this for six months or a year. And so you credit kind of the, the similar leader mentality at, at the Southern Company, your, your civilian job, with success in being able to transition, not just back that first time, but you were reactivated multiple times over and over throughout that, you know, the following that's, 10, 12 that's years. Correct. The, the, the upside of that is it gives me a much broader perspective on what leadership works and what doesn't. The downside for me personally is I didn't advance through the company because they found other people to do jobs while I was gone. So there's a professional sacrifice, if you will, in job growth, because I was off doing these other things, which people are telling me are great, but it puts you out of the running for jobs here. Sure. You leave it, leave for six or eight months at a time or, or even longer. You know, so many soldiers left for 15, 18 months. At that point in time with a civilian job, you've had leaders change out. You might be coming back to a first-line supervisor who's different than the one that you left with who has never seen you work before, and you start kind of all over again with making impressions and establishing your effectiveness in your civilian job. And the worst of the worst is you find people who are either afraid of or threatened by what I've experienced. I had a, a, one of our leaders tell me one time, and specifically when I came back, my job was to provide an increase in the security profile of these nuclear power plants. And we were talking about strategy in a big meeting one day, and he told me he told this whole group that our power plant security must be sufficient because we've never been attacked. And I laughed out loud, and I got reprimanded for it. Uh, but the fact is that, as you know, if you're defending a fixed facility, you've picked the place. The attacker picks the time. And he didn't get that. He told me I was wrong in this whole group of people, and I told him I'm not. I might be really, really uncomfortable for you, but I'm not wrong. That, On the defense, like you yeah. automatically cede the element of surprise in, in most cases. That's, that's right. And just because he has an attack doesn't mean he doesn't want to. It just means he's not ready. Yeah, and I would imagine uh, sure. that's going to seem crazy to so many people that in, in that environment, when you're talking about security of a nuclear power plant, that... Uh, you know, so much security of a fixed location is security of a fixed location. And so uh, I well, would it, assume it, that your expertise level, would be taken. This level of influence, it, it bred complacency that he must be right because he's a vice president. And you know, that's not true. And one of the other attributes of special forces, if I've got some buck private who comes and presents me with a good idea because he happened to live in this country for 10 years, I'm going to listen. But a lot of times in civilian life, if you're not a manager or a director, then how could you know as much as a guy that's making 10 times what you're making? And that, that's, that's a real, real loss right there. Cause he may have the answer. You're just not interested in it. It takes uh, an inordinate amount of humility to be open to ideas from the lowest levels. I believe. That's correct. And well, it's an admission that you don't know everything. 
Sure. And unfortunately, that, that's hard. That's hard to come by in the civilian world. And uh, so, for reference, how many times did you go back and forth to Afghanistan or Iraq in activations uh, before you retired? From 2001 until until your retirement, do you even do you even have even have a comprehensive I count? <laughs> I, I really don't know. I mean, we you know the plane is flying. I'd pack up and go. I really don't know because at the time you didn't have a passport. You just had an ID card and you went. So I don't I don't even remember. I don't even know. Yeah, that's uh double, yeah. double digits, but I don't know what it was. I, so many uh, so many special forces team leaders and team sergeants uh, that that I worked with refer to it uh, they don't they they didn't call them deployments they called them trips yeah yeah because it was just so, so we, common we got special forces guys who actually had been sent over 15 times for 15 separate missions in different countries combat missions the guys that started as the the youngest soldier on a special forces team or even guys that you know enlisted in the enlisted in the army after 2001 who've mm -hmm. gone on a conventional unit deployment the combat deployment and then gone to special forces selection, uh, been promoted, gained additional qualifications and are team sergeants on special forces teams in Iraq right now that enlisted after 9-11 and, and, have, and have risen to the, to the serious levels of leadership on the ground on special forces operations now. You're exactly right. And I'd tell you one of the other benefits for special operations is when we started this in 2001, the guys who were captains and majors or now colonels and generals, and they're making really good decisions. Uh, institutional knowledge is deep at this yep. point. Very deep. Well, I think uh, I think we can wrap it up. We've been talking for a little over an hour and 20 minutes now. Um, but I, I definitely appreciate the insight uh, and the kind of point of view of someone who went back and forth between the civilian job in the military and was also making senior level decisions really in both places at the same time uh, is definitely it, it, a unique it, one. It's very, I'm very lucky and humble to have this variety of experiences because I think it helps me in both worlds. There were times in the military when I would bring a business-like approach to some problem. And likewise here in, in the civilian world, when I make a decision, I guess the most flattering thing anybody ever says to me is we'd like to work with you again because you get things done. Well, that's uh, that's definitely a, a major compliment is the <laughs> the, the yeah. ability to sit to see an issue and, and, and find solutions and find a, a, a way to an answer quickly. And, and the habits habits crosswalk. And I'm sure you probably do this, too. And your friends do it. I plan backwards. I go to the right hand side of the board and write down where I need to be. And then I'd work to the left and figure out how to get there with what my probable courses of action are, what my resources are and which ones work. Uh, it's made a couple of people here angry because their philosophy and their experience is you count your pencils first and see how many you have, and then you set out on this trip to some objective. And I, don't, I just don't do that. In-state, mission statement, all that stuff is essential. And if you have that rolling around in your head, some of these problems become a lot more simple to overcome. Um, one of the things I used to give SF teams, you know, they, they go through a period of isolation before you launch them, and they explain to you how they're going to accomplish a mission. Uh, one of the things I added to that, it's, it's not a requirement, but it was for me, is I gave them success criteria. That is, you know, you, you all successfully defeat the force you're up against, and you all come home whole and safe. And when you have that guidance at the front end, you get in a lot of amorphous situations that that guidance leads to a decision that you get home okay. And I think that's essential. And I do that here. I say, once you know we get this problem solved, I see the end state Here's how it looks for all of us when we get this done. And that's been fascinating to hear reaction to it because uh, that doesn't happen a lot. No, and I think that's, uh, that's a clear lesson to be taken forward is understanding the end state that you want to, to get to, not just from your own perspective, but from all parties involved, and then having that be the start point of your planning and decision making. Yeah, yeah, exactly. It works. That, that simple endorsement, it works. Well, I think that's a that's a great note to end on, and I and I definitely want to have you back on to talk about the route you took in much more detail throughout your career as a citizen soldier and what that looks like and uh, what that looks like for so many people 
Absolutely. Well, I look forward to it, Michael. This is a very enjoyable. It's a great day. General Burford, I really appreciate you, uh, you coming on and hopefully we'll be able to do one of these in person and, uh, in the coming months. I look forward to it. Thanks for listening to the third episode of the show. I'll continue to publish weekly. And if you know someone who you think would be a great guest, please email me at fearencouragepodcast at gmail.com. I started this in part because I selfishly get the chance to talk to incredibly interesting people who've dedicated themselves in some way to service of others. I've had a great number of people suggested as guests, and I'm working my way through those. But if there's someone out there you think would be a great guest, please get in touch with me. Thanks. <laughs>